Good morning, everyone. You don't have to stand up as in the water of school when you say that. Uh, if I could have a little more light in the audience, I'd like to see whom I'm speaking to. So the quote here is from Queen of the Sun. I was asked, with all the mess that we are in, do you still have hope? And so I answered, yes, to the last flower, to the last plant, and we have to have hope. So first I would like to say that it was a tremendous pleasure to be here, my first time in the UK, and I was able to get rid of some prejudices, you know, we all <laughs> have those, like all the Germans love to eat sauerkraut, <laughs> and the French, all the Italians are great lovers. Hope I'm not stepping on any feet. And the French, I won't say anything about the French now. <laughs> and the English are very cool and reserved. And I met so much warmth and spiritual fire that I'm just overjoyed about that. Well, all of you know that the bees are in a crisis. Not only the bees, but the bees foremost now. And the question is, what is a crisis? Well, if you look at the, etymology, at the etymological dictionary, you find out that the Greek word crisis is related to the German kreis and the English circle. And the uniqueness of a circle is that wherever you are, if you want to go to another place, you have to change direction. That is a crisis. There are small crises, that's like a tap on the shoulder. And there are huge crises, that's like having a pistol pointed at you. I think that's where we are right now, because we've had several crises in the last 100 years, 150 years, and one of them all of you know about, that was the crisis that the food quality, the fertility of the land, the fertility of the animals was decreasing tremendously, and a few people noticed that already. And the interesting thing is there are solutions given in a crisis that are appropriate and some that aren't. Now the answer we have in the biodynamic lectures was a very, very deep and appropriate answer to that crisis. And at this point we can say it was not heeded enough. Of course the Second World War and the whole Hitler regime and that time came in and destroyed a lot. Biodynamics was forbidden. I talked to the personal gardener of uh, Hesse, uh, one of the great Nazis, and he had a biodynamic garden, although it was forbidden. Water schools, of course, were closed and all that. So that was a big break in that time of the development of biodynamics and Waldorf and many other things. In the late 50s, there was another great crisis and early 60s, uh, huge pieces of land in America were sprayed with DDT against mosquitoes. And Rachel, not Rachel Carson, and wrote a book, but it was Marjorie Spock, a eurythmist. We saw a beautiful eurythmy performance yesterday. She was a eurythmist, one of the last persons to know Steiner, she just died a few years ago at 103. She had a biodynamic garden, and she was so angry that she sued the state of New York. And every day when she came home from the hearings, and Aaron Pfeiffer had to go to those hearings. He didn't like to do that public work, but he had to go to New York to 
to say something about biodynamics and how dangerous the DTT is and all that. And Marjorie went home and wrote something about that day. And those, those writings became the book Silent Spring, the first really great wake-up call, ecological wake-up call we had. But that book was not heeded either. It was, was really the right direction. As a matter of fact, at the end of the 19th of the 20th century, we were going to be in Spring Valley, we were going to be sprayed for the West Nile virus by plane. And we, four of us, went to the health department. And we said, if you're going to spray us, we have a biodynamic farm, a biodynamic garden, you're going to have a lawsuit. They didn't really understand that because people were clamoring, why didn't we get sprayed yet? So in a conversation with those top officials of the health department, it became clear they had not even heard of the book Silent Spring. So we repeat the same mistakes. And uh, although that call, that call was also not heeded. I returned to the United States in 96. And two months later, an article in the New York Times appeared, The Hush of the Hives. There were gardens, there were farms, no more bees there. And of course, I knew from my work in Germany as a gardening teacher and beekeeper that it was not only the pesticides and all that, but it was also the beekeeping that was a problem. And two months later, I gave my first organic beekeeping workshop in, at a farm in Harlemville, Upper State New York. And the solutions offered were chemicals against the varroa mites. You know, there you wanted to find the chemical that would kill all the mites, the silver bullet. And of course, we know there are only silver bullets in the cowboy movies. And there are no silver bullets. So I wrote a book towards saving the honeybee. It's in the third edition now. And slowly and slowly and slowly, a new awakening began that there may be something wrong with beekeeping, not only with the pesticides and insecticides and all that. Up to today, that's basically the only thing you will read in the newspaper. The neonicotinoids, a very invasive kind of chemical, are killing the bees, and not only the bees, everything else. And the Environmental Protection Agency in America just allowed a more aggressive kind of neonicotinoid to be used. So uh, there is little hope for that, that this will change drastically. So the beekeeping methods were also uh, very invasive and are still very invasive. And that has to do with making beekeeping a profession. When you have a business, you can't be losing money. You have to make money. So everything that was invented from the end of the 19th century on was to make beekeeping more profitable. Everything, every little thing. And it was actually a wake-up call for me to realize why the bees are in such a bad state. Why don't we have the crisis with the cows and the pigs? We actually do on some of those uh, industrialized farms in, uh, in the States, in the, in the United States, uh, the cow has a life expectancy of four to five years, a guaranteed 0.9, not even one calf. So most people don't know that. And of course, the chickens can't hatch their own eggs anymore because everything is done in the incubator. And the poor pigs, they, uh, 
don't lead a very happy life either in those boxes where they can't even turn around their own axis. 6,000 pigs in one huge hall. Can you imagine that? So the animals are suffering greatly. And it is really the bees that are waking us up more because everybody seems to love the bees. Maybe because everybody likes honey. But it doesn't matter whether you love the bees or not. The beekeepers have their profession, and the profession is to make money. And so everything has been geared to that. Not long ago, there was an advertisement in one of the magazines in America. We asked some bees what would make them more profitable. And that is the gist of the problem. We cannot work with nature in the same way as we can work in industry. In other words, it's uh, reasonable to make one factory specialized, so you don't make 10 different things, but maybe one thing well, and that makes it cheaper. The laws of nature are diversity and not mono. So everything that was actually developed by the monks starting you know, in the Middle Ages, the honeybee came out of the mystery centers, out of the mystery centers of Atlantis, when the animals were not as fixed as they are now, when the human being was still more pliable and not as solid as now. And in the ancient Persian time, in the ancient Egyptian time, the honeybee was really part of the temple scene. The Greeks, the Greek women, the servants, were called bees, Melissa. So out of the temple scene, the bee came, into the, came to the monks in Christian times. And up to the 20th century and up to very recent times, Brother Adams here in, in in the UK was one of the last monks who revolutionized beekeeping with a buckfast bee, a, hybrid, a hybridized bee that was also supposed to be the silver bullet. And it was only in the 19th century when public education came, when beekeeping came to the teachers. And enough had been invented then at the end of the 19th century that beekeeping beekeeping could become a profession. Removable frames, boxes that you can move around, everything else. And everything that was invented then served that purpose, to make beekeeping easier for the beekeeper and profitable, more profitable for the beekeeper. So the biggest beekeeper in America just a few years ago had 70,000 colonies. And two years ago, he lost a third of them. That's about the average losses each year in America. So you can imagine, maybe you can't imagine, I can hardly imagine that 23,000 boxes or hive boxes in a row of dead bees. That is what is happening in America. And it's happening more and more all over the world. Wherever modern beekeeping has been taken, these problems do occur. So let me just explain a few things that have been invented that really go against the nature of the bee and the health of the bee. One is that the bee is an insect that loves to explore the vicinity and not just go to a big field of rapeseed or canola oil, as they call it. Rapeseed sounds pretty nasty, so they call it Canadian oil. Canola is the rapeseed, actually. And you have maybe 50,000 acres of rapeseed there. Uh, but the bees explore the eyebright and the plantain and all the medicinals that are, that are in, a, in an area. And that is their health, not driven from monoculture to monoculture. And some of those beekeepers in America, they take their bees in 
February, actually end of January, from Florida or from New York over to California for the almonds and the citrus fruit and back to New Jersey for the uh, cranberries, up to New York for the apples, up to Maine for the blueberries, down to Florida again, up to 100,000 miles a year from one monoculture, from one insecticide, from one pesticide to the other one. Of course, the beekeepers now know that this is a stress on the bees. But like in politics, they don't really look very much at the beekeeping methods. You know, it's the pesticides and it's this and that, but it's not them. It's like um, a few years ago, where was the axis of evil? Must be there in North Korea or somewhere like that, not here, right? So the axis of evil is really right here, and it's not over there. And if we don't tackle it here, it's going to be wars everywhere else. So then came the removable frames, which is actually not good for the bees themselves, but it lets you inspect the hive and do a few things. And then they found out that the wax moth eats up those wax honeycomb if you don't tend to it, if you want to store them. And so they invented plastic frames. You have the imprint of the cells imprinted on a sheet of plastic, and that is given into a frame. And the bees are then forced to use that and build their honeycomb cells on them. Now, I'm, in my workshops, I'm quite drastic, and I ask the women, would you like a plastic insert in your uterus for raising the baby? And nobody ever said yes. This is where the bees raise their young ones. You know, but we put a piece of plastic in there. Or we wire the frames so that we can extract the frames of honey quicker. What do the wires do in a, in a hive? They, you know, they, we don't know what they really do, but they are not good. I have a picture, I'll show you that later, wherever the wires are, the bees don't build the cells. So that was another great invention. And if you order a new box and a, a starter kit, as they say, you automatically get plastic frames. Another thing that was invented, and you can read about that in Steiner's lectures on bees, which I hope all of you read, because they are so full of information and inspiration. There was a beekeeper, Herr Müller, at these lectures, and he was just so enthusiastic about all those new inventions, like creating queens out of worker larvae. And he said, yes, now the colonies are bigger, and they give us more honey. And Steiner was so delicate, he didn't say, you are all wrong. <laughs> As a matter of fact, in that lecture, he didn't say anything. And a few lectures later, he says, well, we can't notice the changes and the damages, but if that is kept up, the bee might not survive the end of the century, last century. That's how grave these modern inventions are. And I'll try and explain that a little bit to you. You see, the worker bees are all raised in horizontal hexagonal cells. One row points this way, or one side, and the other side points this way. And the queen cells, the, or the queens, are raised from the beginning in round cells, like the, the cup of an acorn, a round cell, and the egg is then pointing toward the sun. The egg is pointing up and not going horizontal. And they found out in the 19th century already, in the last few decades, that the bees can make an emergency queen if the queen is lost, 
by taking a young larva, changing the shape, making that cell from horizontal into vertical, and that can be a, an emergency queen. Nowadays, about 99.9% .9 of our queens are raised that way. And the difference we don't really know because the queens outwardly still look like a queen. But if you just notice that this level here is the level, the social level, we all work for each other. That's why our hands are free and not tied to the ground like the animals. We work for each other. And the, the fruit tree gives fruit in that realm, not in that realm. That is connected to the sun. But the queen has to be connected to the sun from the very beginning, and that's why she's in that vertical position. And that position in us is also our own royalty. Everyone, men and women, have a king. And we have a princess too, the soul that has been put asleep by materialism. And it is our spirit that has to awaken the soul again with a mild kiss to awake from that deep sleep of materialism and make headway in the spiritual way. So we have bred, year by year, we have bred the royalty out of the queen. That's why Steiner was able to say, it won't last, the joy won't last long. We might see it at the end of the century. Let's talk in 80 years, he said. So in 2003, they talked. And Mr. Muller had to admit that Steiner was right, that we are in a great danger of losing the bee if we continue that. So the other thing is, if you see trucks half the size of this room filled with corn syrup, go to the apiaries, and each hive gets about four gallons of corn syrup, all genetically manipulated, of course, as a winter feed. They take all the honey, and the bees have to survive on corn syrup. It's cheaper than sugar. See, I, I could go on and on. Everything that was invented was invented by asking, what can I get out of it? And the time has come now when I have to say, well, it's really the Parsifal question. What ails thee? What's wrong with you? What hurts you? What can I do for you? And not how much honey do I get out of you? It still is a practice when people find out I'm a beekeeper. It used to be much more drastic, you know, uh, but now it's a little bit more, uh, it's not quite as frequent. They, they right away ask, how much honey did you get last year from your bees? And I'm very rude. I say, what did you get out of your husband last year? <laughs> or what did you get out of your wife last year? Or how much did you get out of your wife last year? You know? And they look stunned at first, and then I can say, is that a loving relationship? It really isn't. Not when we ask, what can I get? How much milk? How much butter? How, much, how many eggs? How many pounds of bacon can I get out of that animal? That is not a loving relationship. So we have to really see as beekeepers that, yes, uh, we can do a lot for the bees already by changing our beekeeping methods. We don't have to wait till the USDA, or I don't know what institution that is here in, in Britain, uh, says that uh, normal conventional agriculture has to go on without all the insecticides and pesticides and monocultures. I don't think we can wait for that. I think the, 
the catastrophe and the crisis has to grow exponentially before that happens. It still works. When we were with Spike Nut Farm in Illinois, we drove through fields for 15 minutes with a car for 20 minutes through fields of corn, 10 feet tall. You couldn't even see beyond the road. And it, it's so impressive because every stalk has the same height. Everything looks perfect. And there are farmers that farm 5,000 acres, but they can't make a living on it. They farm it as a side job. Big corporations have bought up the land and hire somebody to go onto the land three times a year with huge machines, and that's farming. And then the people have a side job where they make the daily money. So a lot has changed, and I think the crisis is now uh, at a point where we are beginning to re-examine what we are doing to the bee. Because the bee is sort of um, the tip of the iceberg of a greater problem. How do we work with nature? What laws do we use? There's this wonderful book by Nikolaus Rehmer. I think it's out of print. So you might put a little force on the Biodynamic Association in America to get it in print again. It's called Laws of Life in Agriculture. Beautiful, beautiful book. So what are the bees really asking us? What is their language? Why, how do they relate to us that they are suffering? Their language is the health and the illness. Same with the, far, with the cows, same with the pigs and the chickens and the goats. They cannot voice it, but their state of health tells us that they are suffering. And what it takes is actually a huge step in that circle that if we don't change, right now we are heading this way into a total destruction of nature. And the change shouldn't really only be from point A to point B. It has to be a rather drastic change, you know, from point A to point B. Drastic change is called for in beekeeping and agriculture. And this is where we have insights and knowledge from Rudolf Steiner that are a tremendous help in knowing what the right thing is. Not that we exclude everything else. I mean, good organic practices are the basis for biodynamics. You can't have a good biodynamic farm or garden if you don't adhere to good organic practices. So the call is actually a spiritual call. The call is actually one that says, overcome your materialistic view of nature. Because the organic movement is pretty much still in the same mindset. So when I give a talk to organic farmers and I say, what makes your farm organic? They tell me, well, I don't use these chemicals. I use the other ones. And they can have a monoculture and still be certified organic. And I ask them, well, what does an organism have? What well, has organs? Where are the organs on your farm? They don't know. Well, your field is one organ. Your pasture is another organ. Your hedgerows are organs. Your woods, your pond, your stream, these are all organs. And with, a, with a, an understanding of that, you can say, do I only have a lung but no liver? So it is a, a spiritual crisis that underlies all the other crises we have, the economic crisis, the social crisis, the education crisis, crisis in, in the arts, in the sciences. 
All of these are actually spiritual crises. And Steiner once said that if we do not spiritualize our, our understanding of nature, we will not be able to go forward in evolution. It's a very, very drastic statement. So we have to spiritualize our understanding of the chemistry, of the botany, of the microbiology, of animal husbandry, everything that has to do with nature, we have to re-examine and find out where are the materialistic points. What, what, how do we understand something where we know a lot materialistically? What is the component, component that is missing? So, at one point, I was very interested in how the sap in a tree or a plant rises. And I shared that with a, with a teacher at the Max Planck Gymnasium in Germany. And he said, oh, I'll give you a few books. He gave me a whole stack of biology books. And I looked at that chapter. And everyone said that there are four criteria for raising the sap. There is root pressure, there is osmosis, cell pressure, and evaporation. And then I found one book that was written by a, a gardener, not an anthroposophist, Hans Mollisch, who actually wrote, and that book was published 1919. And he said, uh, for the real answer, we have to look into the realm of life. And that's exactly the component, component that's missing. Because when you stand in front of a giant sequoia tree, 300 feet tall, the first branch comes out at 100 feet, <laughs> as big as our oaks here. And that sap going to that last needle on top, you will never get it up with the four things that are mentioned, never. You get it up a certain amount. But you have to look at the etheric body of that plant, of the life body of the plant, which is connected to the sun. And that is the missing point. So let me just uh, give you a few examples um, how we can look, how we can understand the animal. We all, as farmers, gardeners, we know about animals, but how do I spiritualize my understanding of the animal? Well, first of all, you can go to a dictionary and find out that the word animal is related to anima, the Greek word soul. It is a being that has a soul. The plant doesn't have a soul. Even if you read that book by Tompkins, The Secret Life of Plants, where he says the plants have emotions. It's not true. The plant doesn't have emotions. A farmer proved that once. I took a 10th grade to a nature preserve once, and actually a biodynamic farm, and there was a nature preserve there, and the fellow at the nature preserve gave a talk, and he kept talking about the feeling of those plants. And that farmer sat there in the first row, and he was a choleric, small guy. He became more and more edgy. And at one point, he jumped up and he said, if those plants have feelings, I can't mow the grass tomorrow. <laughs> and that settled it for the class. But a plant reacts to what is in the soil, to the water, to the air, to the sun, to your emotions. But a reaction is not feeling. So a mousetrap, Steiner gives that example, reacts when you touch it, or the mouse touches it, but that is not feeling. See, this kind of understanding of what an animal is 
is very important because anima, the soul, gives, us, gives the animal and us too two possibilities. Movement and feeling. Motion and emotion. So right away you know an animal has to move. You can't lock it up. It's damaging to its health if you lock up that chicken and that pig and the cow in a feedlot. And another interesting thing is that that animal that I see here is not an individual like I am. Steiner talks about the group soul of the animal. The group soul radiates its wisdom down into each animal so that the dog wags its tail when it's happy and the cat wags its tail when she's unhappy. And the dog purrs, no, the cat purrs when she is happy and the dog growls when he's unhappy. They're constantly mixing up their signals. And what does modern science say? Where does that come from? See, there you see one of the tremendous stupidities of modern science. They think all of that is an acid that does it, the DNA. An acid can't determine how you feel, what you think, and how you move. But the group soul does that. And the DNA and the genes, they are tools for that spiritual, high spiritual being that radiates its wisdom down. We call that wisdom instinct. And then we think we know everything. The American Indians were still a bit there because they, when they gave sacrifices to the buffalo before they hunted, they didn't give it to the physical buffalo. They gave it to the great buffalo. When they fished, they gave sacrifices and gratitude and thanks to the great fish and the great deer. So they, the American Indians up to the 18th century, 19th century, had that understanding that there is something spiritual, something that does not appear physically on earth here, that has to do with that animal. So, how do we get a feeling and a real experience for a group soul? Well, I'll give you a few examples. We had chickens, we still do, but in New York, we had to have a run that was covered with a net because of all the hawks there. And it happened twice that a hawk came down, landed on the net, couldn't get into the run. All the chickens went into the house, even the rooster turned chicken. <laughs> and the hawk was outside the fence sitting there. And we actually felt pity for it because he couldn't get his dinner. And all of a sudden, one chicken came out and ran in front of the hawk, inside the fence, up and down. Now, don't think that the rooster said, you are it. <laughs> About half a year later, when that happened, I listened to a program on public radio, and an American Indian, Lakota Indian, a woman, talked about their reservations and they raise buffaloes. And they have a big, strong fence paid for the government, by the government. And they kill an animal once in a while. And before they do it, they have a day of ritual, of song and drumming and sacrifice. And then they go, a certain number of people go up to the fence where the gate is, where the feeding feed station is, and they do their drumming, and the whole herd comes from the hills and collects there, waiting for food, probably. 
and then they stop the drumming and wait. And the whole herd disappears and one animal comes back. And that is the one they kill. And I was so overjoyed as an understanding of the group soul. If you see a lioness hunting, it's the same thing. There's a herd of zebras, and one zebra goes off to one side. It's not always the oldest or the sickest. And that's the one that's the meal. It's the group soul that decides who is the sacrifice, who is to be eaten. And for the animal, it doesn't matter when it is killed. How it lives is the most important part. But the group soul takes that soul, that spiritual soul, back into its group soul and sends other ones down. So understanding an animal from a higher spiritual point of view lets us determine whether we keep animals in an animal-appropriate way, one that serves them and every time we play along with instinct, we serve the health of the animal. Every time we go against instinct, like feeding a cow high protein feed, we actually damage the animal. So there are also group souls of plants. And to get a feeling for the group soul, you have to sort of look at the fat plant families. So the nutritionists, would lo they love to do that. You know. Look at a plant family. So let's take the labiat family. The labiat family, marjoram, rosemary, beautiful rosemary bushes out here. Oregano, thyme, these are all in the labiate family. And the labiate family has that idiosyncrasy that what usually happens in a seed, a lot of collection of oil moves down one level into the leaf. And the healing takes place there. So marjoram oil, oregano oil, thyme oil, great healers. And oil is warmth. So they're used to warm the body in the therapies. And they are used also to warm the tomato. So why do we put oregano and marjoram and thyme and rosemary into the Italian uh, potato, uh, tomato dish? It's because the tomato has a cooling effect. And we need to warm it a little bit in order to make it really healthy for us. And there you get an inkling of a group soul that does one thing, one specialty in a very good way. Or another example, if you look at the umbellifera family. So your anise, your fennel, your coriander, and your caraway are great examples of that family. And they all have a hollow stem. They all have a hollow stem. There is air in the stem. And that tells you they have a relationship to air. And governing air. And so when you have a heavy rye bread, you want to put exactly those into your rye bread to control the air that might be developed if you don't use them. So that's the secret of spices. It's not just to make things a little bit better tasting. Good, uh, you know, the housewife that really knows these families and how to play with them can do a lot of preventative healing already. So group soul of the plants we can also look at. Anthroposophic doctors do that as an exercise. What does one family do and what does one plant in that family do 
completely different. And then you find out what, it, what its healing power is. With uh, minerals, it's probably the most difficult because they are, you know, you look at a stone and you wonder, does that stone, does that silica that I have in my hand have a group soul? Or that limestone here? And I think the agricultural lectures give us a wonderful, wonderful example of that, of finding a little bit of a, a venue to understanding the group soul of those minerals. When Steiner talks about the silica and makes it so personable, he says, silica is like an aristocrat, a true aristocrat. Not a robber baron, but a baron. <laughs> and those aristocrats, they looked out for their people. They made sure that they, that they were well, a true aristocrat. There was a lot of selflessness in that. And that's how he characterizes silica, like a selfless aristocrat wanting nothing for itself and just giving. Just like our senses, they just stay there. They want nothing for themselves. The eye doesn't want to experience the red or the blue, but it just passes that information on to the brain. So that is that selfless gentleman. That is silica. Or it was mentioned two days ago that silica, 50%, about 50% of the Earth's mantle is, are silicates. And they are the eye, they are the organ of perception for what goes on with the planets moving in front of the zodiac in conjunctions and oppositions and trines and everything else. That is a silica that does it. And in our computer, it's the basis of our computer. The silicon, without the oxygen, it senses yes or no. And at a speed that we can't imagine, it gives a signal. It lets something through or not. That's the basis of a computer. So Silicon Valley is a very special place of a lot of perception. And it's interesting that people in the Silicon Valley now send their children to the Waldorf School. Because they know, they know that if you let your children go to the computers too early, it's not healthy for them. So the limestone, the opposite, greedy, Steiner characterizes, becomes greedy in spring. It has an animal quality. I lived on limestone for 16 years in Heidenheim in Germany. And the Waldorf School was in a, built in a quarry, in a former quarry. So we were in limestone. And to rejuvenate and to feel good again, you went on vacation on silica, not on limestone again. As a matter of fact, there is a word in German <laughs> that says it. You feel ausgemergelt. Mergel is limestone. You feel limed out if you're really exhausted. So that's, these give you an indication of group soul activity, the spiritual side of the physical that we see with our senses. And if you then look into the apocalypse of St. John, and you see that the New Jerusalem is formed out of those minerals, out of the purified minerals, the gems, then you get an inkling what the transformation of the earth is asking for. And the, you know what the gates to the New Jerusalem are made of. There's a song about it. The pearly gates. The pearls are the entrance. 
our transformed suffering here on earth. And life is a suffering. It's a crisis. It's an ongoing crisis if you're awake for it. Birth is a crisis. Man, you leave that womb. Hit the earth. First teeth are a crisis. Second teeth are a crisis. Puberty is a crisis. And each time we have to leave something behind and develop something new. 21, becoming adult is a crisis. Then comes the midlife crisis. Then comes the second midlife crisis. <laughs> that should have a different name because it happens around 55, 60. <laughs> it's not midlife anymore unless you get to be 110. And then the third teeth are a crisis. And the hearing aid is a crisis. <laughs> Life is a crisis, in other words, an opportunity to change and to grow. Nothing negative, a great blessing that we have crises, otherwise we would just continue what we are doing. See, that's actually what is called for in every realm, how we work with money, architecture, the arts, the sciences. And the sciences are at the core of it because everything we see around us in our culture, how we farm, how we cook, how we do basically everything is dictated by our materialistic understanding and scientific discoveries. And it is a real challenge, really, it's a real challenge to start learning. And there is no way around it. <laughs> there is no way around it that, we, that it takes a lot of learning, a lot of work. And the best way to learn is really that you study Steiner's lectures. It doesn't matter what you're interested in. You always find something. And if you don't have the money to buy the books, then download it. Mr. Google will help you. I was so fortunate when I did my teacher training in Stuttgart. I then, after a while, went to an anthroposophic doctor, one of the really well-known ones at that time, Dr. Husemann. And he sat me in a chair, he sat behind big desk, and he looked at me for about five minutes. I was ready to jump out of that chair. <laughs> because he didn't say a word. <laughs> and after a conversation, he gave me some medicines. But he then said, you should, yeah, I came out of my hippie days, you know, and not very formed and all that. And he said, um, you should take one of, basic, one of Steiner's basic books and select a day, a time of the day, and read in it every day. And it doesn't matter whether you read one sentence or 10 pages, but do it. He didn't tell me that it's a fantastic way of developing will. And I started with theosophy, and in about six, seven months, I was finished and started the next one. So the people who say, I don't have time for that, I'm a farmer, I'm tired in the evening, <laughs> absolutely no excuse. <laughs> absolutely no excuse. You can read one sentence, it might take you two years then, especially in America, it's probably different here, but then people say, I can't reach China, it's too difficult. I say, I know why it's so difficult, you can't sink. <laughs> we don't learn sinking in, in school. We don't learn sinking by reading the newspaper or reading a James Joyce novel. 
But reading theosophy or esoteric science or how to know higher worlds, one of the basic books, that is a training in thinking. And the second time you read it, you understand more. And the third time you read it, you understand even more. You have to start learning to think again. 5,000, 10,000 years ago, the development of the human being came from the bottom up, from the Kundalini fire to the head. And those people who did that training were then able to guide civilization. And it's the other way around. You can't feed yourself on warmed up soup. Something that was good 5,000 years ago may not be very valid. It may be nice and easy because it's an established path, but the development now goes through our thinking, through the two-leafed locust flower, all the way down. It has to go through the heart. And it is really our, our ability to have discernment and to think and to explain people whom we meet who are not anthroposophists. This develops real friendships, not just being buddy-buddy, you know, and I, I, it's okay what you're doing, I'm doing something different. Explain it to them. I met a cardiologist professor in Illinois, she was a professor at the university, and I found out through my brother that she's a, she is a cardiologist. She teaches about the heart. So I love to tickle people with thoughts. And I came over to her and I said, what do you teach? What is the heart? And that question was already a little bit, where are you, where are you coming from? You know, are you stupid or what? What is the heart? And she said, well, the heart is a pump. I said, how is that possible? We have miles and miles of veins and arteries, some thinner than a hair. And from all I learned in physics, the thinner a vessel is, the more power it takes to pump something through. And then an embryologist in 1971 or so, in the Czech, Czechoslovakia at that time, he found out that the embryo has an independent blood circulation, independent from the mother, before the heart is even formed. So I had that conversation with her, and I respect that woman because she said, very interesting. And I did not expect her to go to her students the next day and say, I, I was all wrong. <laughs> you know. But to get into a conversation, you have to know a few things. You have to know, you have to learn about biodynamics and not only the agriculture lecture. You know, Steiner expected those farmers to have a knowledge of basic anthroposophy. And only that will really bring out, you know, your ability to talk to people and tell them why something is wrong. So Fritz Sattler, who wrote that, I think, one of the best books on biodynamics, biodynamic farming practice, we lived in the same town and I was fortunate to learn with him and from him. Um, he is able to go to the universities and talk about biodynamics. Why? Because he knows both sides. Those both sides. So that is actually the quest we are on, that we, we deepen our knowledge spiritually, and then we can find in the moment, in the practical work, the inspiration how to do something that is appropriate for the plant, for the animal, and maybe for the fellow human being. Of course, for the human being, we don't have a group soul. Every human being is his own group soul, so to say. 
So we have to develop what we now call, and there's a big movement, what we call now empathy, to feel yourself into the other and come back. And this correspondence then is what actually lets us come into deeper relationships. So it's the empathy, the feeling for the other. And that feeling lets us then say, what ails thee? So we don't have to go on that long road of suffering that Parseval did, all the mistakes and the killing and everything else that he had to do before he was able to go to Amfortas and say, what ails thee? That is the question now what the bees are telling us. In all relationships, not to say anymore, what, what can I get out of you? Hilde Pfeiffer, who was a gardener at this beautiful biodynamic farm in Heidenheim with Fritz Sattler, she used to say, we don't have to beat the earth and flagellate it and hit it to produce. You just stroke it, you love it, you give it what it needs, and it will produce everything we need. And she had such a beautiful garden. I raised, because I had a greenhouse as a gardening teacher, I raised some of the plants for her because she was in a valley where they could have frost every month of the year. I experienced a frost there on August 18th. In August, a frost. You know? So I raised the cabbage for her and things like that. And I, we planted on the same day. And within weeks, her plants were much more beautiful than mine because my school garden was in the old quarry. They filled up some earth, so it was not the grown soil, and it was not, you know, it was still, still needed a lot of healing. But uh, yes, we don't have to beat the animals, we don't have to force it. With enough understanding and enough love, we can really do a lot. And love only is possible through understanding. True love. It's not just a feeling or, you know, sympathy or antipathy. It's really in a partnership you have to ask, how can I further you? What can I do to help you? That is love. And the people who work with handicapped people, you know, they need that. They need that. We, we all need it. We all need it. So that is the call of the honeybee now suffering tremendously for our mistakes. And we are not going to reverse things in beekeeping right away because everything else is still around. The greed, the aggression, the cell phone towers, our own inabilities, all of that stands a little bit in the way. And we have to train our perception for the bees, too, and to find out why they're doing that. I mean, we at Spikenard Farm, we don't have all the answers. We are still finding things out. Remarkable things are happening in the animal world now. I get a lot of those YouTube clips from people. And one I got where there's an elk in a zoo, and he's mooing looking around, standing there by a big uh, vessel with water. And nobody's coming there. And all of a sudden, that, that elk puts one antler into the water and pulls out a little animal and saves it. So there are new things happening. The bees are not only swarming in May and June, but they are now already starting to swarm in July, August, September. Last year, we had a swarm in October. 
And at first you think, a swarm in October, I don't think I'm sober. But my wife, uh, she started doing that just very rarely because it shouldn't be overdone. She, uh, we, on our farm, we had to find, uh, because we had to drill a well, we had to find a good spot. So she said, let me try dowsing. And she doused and found three good spots. And one that she picked, we drilled and we had uh, found very, not too deep, you know, not 800 feet, but 300 feet already, 10 gallons of water a minute, which is pretty good. And so when we had that swarm in October, we were actually up in the air. We were helpless to find out why did that swarm swarm so late. It's suicide. And so she doused the 10 hives that were possible where that came from because the, my intern said they came out of that bee house, but they didn't know which one. And one, one colony said, we swarmed. In other words, positive answer went with a question. I opened the hive, sure enough, queen cells in there, and no old queen there, and sure enough, that was the one. And then she said, but the next one, right next to it, doesn't really give me an answer. So she went back, and still no, not an answer. And then she asked, do you have a queen? Negative answer. So I opened the hive. No brood, no eggs, no larva, no pupa, no queen. And we were able to give that swarm to that hive. <laughs> So miraculous things are developing in the animal world in relation to the human being, too. And we have to become aware. We have to become sensitive. We have to train our perception. So we can have a little bit of a, of a question or comment session. I'll show you a few pictures here from where we are. We are in Virginia. We were in Illinois, but for the first time ever in 19, uh, in 19, no, in 2009, they started spraying by airplane right next to our farm, corn and soy. <coughs> And the farmers told us never before because it's a hilly part of Illinois. And so that was one of the things that made us move and look for another place. And things just come at you. A friend said, oh, talk to a friend of mine. He has land in Virginia. I bet he would love to have your honeybee sanctuary there. And I did, and that within two months we moved left Illinois, took the organization, we have a nonprofit organization, took it to Virginia in the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's a beautiful area. In the background, you see the Smoky Mountains. So it's uh, the oldest, it's said to be the oldest mountains or one of the oldest mountains on earth. We are on silica. I mean, we find silica rocks that are almost pure. It's just fantastic. Forest, forest, forest. We are blessed to not have Monsanto next door to us. We have an organic farm next to us. I mean, we are not that secluded as this picture. This is taken from the Buffalo Mountain, where you can see 360 degrees. This is part of our hill, right in the foreground. We have now 25 acres, which is what, about 10 hectares. And beautiful valley with a stream in it. It's just. Yeah, we feel at home because it has evergreens too, not just, yeah. We have some of the bottom land. This is uh, mustard. So we can grow on about six acres, we can grow forage for the bees. 
because we have about 30 colonies on those 25 acres. And you can't just have more and more bees there without making sure that they have enough food because we only take the surplus and we don't feed sugar, so we want them to build up on, on their own honey. This was sown by hand, not by machine. So I teach the young farmers to be how to sow with a hand. I don't know how many of you know that. The farmer, when he dug into his apron, he never threw the kernels away. He always threw them over his heart. You know, simple things like that. And you get a pretty good stand. Maybe not as perfect as with a machine, but still pretty good. And that field is humming. And then we have an, a clover. That's the um, crimson clover. And some weeds in there too, and some red clover, and some white clover. And that is the hawk looking for the chickens and the meal. And that's, uh, we, we plant more and more forage for bees, annuals and perennials, a lot of medicinal plants too. The sage and the thyme and yeah, just a lot. Uh, you can go on our website, Spike and Nut Farm, and we have a big list of annuals and perennials that are good. This in the foreground is a worry hive right here. So we have six different hives where we are. We, we, are, we are also do research. What is the positive and what is the negative of the different hive shapes? And that's important that there is not one that is only positive. They all have a negative side too. The cosmos, of course, is one of the great plants. Here is our hill. We also have a vegetable garden and a yurt. Fantastic clouds. Sometimes we just look at the clouds for five minutes and stop working because it's so beautiful. And this is, for example, motherwort, motherwort in German, Herzgespann. It's heart med medicine and a female tonic, but great, great forage for the bees for about four weeks. My wife is the one who has the patience to photograph those. I don't. I'm too impatient. So that's a yurt. We sell a little bit of honey and T-shirts and an entrance reducer and things like that. But most of our money comes not only from our workshops, but from donations. We have about two, 300 people donating once or twice a year and a few foundations. And with that, we can work for them and for the honeybees. Beautiful hillside there. There we have a under that little roof, we have a hexagonal hive, an upright hexagonal hive. And we have workshops. We don't own a suit. We have a veil in case we need it. But when we work, we work with a hat. And sometimes in t-shirts, we don't have protection out of principle. Because when you are all suited up and protected, you can go in like a Rambo. You know, you can do what you want when you want it. But when you are vulnerable, as the bees are, you go into the hive with a different attitude. And um, we rarely get a sting. And when we do, we say thank you. Because the bee has died, and I don't have any arthritis. And the interesting thing is, you know, we have a law in America that when the inspector comes, he has to be able to lift the frames out to check for foul brood. Now, I have never had a hive with foul brood in 40 years, you know. And I have some hives where you can't draw a frame because they've built it as they wanted it. So I had a bee inspector come. And I made sure that I said, in this hive, we can't open up because you can't draw any frames. He didn't say a word. 
He didn't say a word. And he was the only one in a suit. And the second time he came, I saw him come out of the truck with a suit under the arm. He looked around and put the suit back. <laughs> so this is how we change the world, one woman at a time. That's bone set. <laughs> One woman at a time, <laughs> one man at a time, or a couple. <laughs> we have to get together, too. Alone, it's very difficult. We need partners. You know? And one of my favorite verses by Steiner is this beautiful verse, the spiritual goals which bring people together form the most noble bonds of friendship. Not that you drink a bottle of ale with somebody, but the spiritual goals that bring us together, like here, form the most noble bonds of friendship. Clary Sage. And there in the background, you see a, a platform. We now have three hives on that platform. It's about six feet tall, about three meters tall. And it's a bear platform, not for bears, but to protect the bees from bears. We have bears right a few hundred meters from us. You know? So fortunately, and there we try to also have a spiritual fence, not only a physical fence. Uh, in the five years that we are there, no bear has destroyed anything. Well, whereas at home, I had a bear destroy, right in town, I had a bear destroy four of my hives. I was able to save one queen and a few bees, and that name is now the name of that hive. We name our hives, too. It's called Bearina. And for about half a year, she was very aggressive. And that's why you wear light clothes and not dark clothes. And if you wear a beard, you might get more stings. If you look like a bear. <laughs> Russian sage, another fantastic plant. We just built that this year. It has the sun hive in it. It was a gift from one of the classes. And a special place. People can sit down and watch. And you know, we try to make everything as beautiful as we can. Because beauty for us is not you know, the icing on the cake. It's part of the cake. It's very important. Beauty, the, the Greek word cosmos, means beauty and order. And I tell that to interns when I go into a room and I see it looks like a, a tsunami was there. Some of the young people, they can't keep order. You know, I tell them, well, try and keep order, and you're more cosmic. And then one of the artists in that group painted that for us, you know. <laughs> Holy basil. Wow, the bees are in it from June until frost. Great plant. Or pussy willows for the early spring. Look at the pollen that they gather there. Oh, uh, yeah, well, we can go faster. So when we spray silica preparation, we also spray a little bit into the hive and around the hive. And that's one of the measures we take. And see, right here you see, oh, pardon me. Right here you see a hive that has two deeps and three supers. In July, when they have three supers, we can take one super of honey. That is really surplus. If it has four supers filled up, we can take two. But we leave them enough to live on their own honey. 
Have you ever heard the expression, paper is patient? You can write anything you want on paper. It doesn't have to be true. So I got a book from a German friend, put your hives in a seven-star formation and you don't have any varroa mites. We tried it for three years, not true. <laughs> well, we also relaxed by the bees and the straps are there in case a bee comes, a bear comes in. So that's my winter beard. But, you know, that's how we work. And we hand those frames of bees around and people don't get stung if the bees are prepared the day before. I tell them, only sting the ones that really need it. <laughs> this is a top bar hive. And it's true, they do. And it's a pedagogical tool. I remember in Heidenheim, there was one eighth grader, who, Christopher, who, who did not calm down. And it was, according to the calendar, a leaf day, a water day. And that's when you get the most stings. And I said, well, calm down, you're going to get stung. Sure enough, he was out there in the garden, he got stung. I pulled out the stinger and said, calm down, you're going to get stung if you don't. He didn't get he didn't calm down, he got a second sting. Pedagogical gold. <laughs> this is a hexagonal hive a friend made for me. And it is beautiful that in those different shapes, how the bees really enjoy not being in a rectangular box. That's, you, you have a window, you don't have to open the hive all the time. You can see how they develop. This hive filled up just about everything in one season. Just fantastic development. That's my intern, actually. I, I feel so fortunate. Alex came this year from the university, but he loves anthroposophy. We study it twice a week. And he's a beekeeper, he, you know, and I, he's, he wants to stay. So at my age, you know, you have to look for succession too. You can't just keep on working. So that's a top bar hive. There's only a top bar here, yeah, this top bar. And then they build a natural honeycomb. That's a worry hive. We, uh, that field of American sweet clover, about that high. I mean, you want to sleep in that field during the day when the bees are there. It is buzzing with activity, just fantastic. Such a joy. See, that's another thing. You see bees are not wasps. When, in, especially in America, whenever a bee is depicted, it's black and yellow and naked. Bees have so much hair. They are hairy beings. Each eye has 6,000 individual facet eyes, and each of them has a hair growing out of it. Can you imagine that? So bees are lucky that they don't have eyelids. Tulip, rose, there you see. They have hair on their feelers, on their eyes, everywhere, on their legs. And the hairs are sense organs. They taste with it. They don't only feel. Blueberries. There you see a native bee. We have, in America, 4,000 species of native bees. Oh. Oh, oh. Arman span an. There he goes. <laughs> he listened. <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah this year we, uh, last year we raised enough money to build a beautiful pavilion, a room for extraction, uh, just great. Um, we went on 30K, $30,000 in 30 days. And we got 42,000. And we were able to build this. So here we have a biodynamic workshop where we stir preparations. I do have, it's not in the picture, I have one pot that is ceramic, ceramic, and it was used by Ehrenfried Pfeiffer. It's a holy vessel. <laughs> and there, one of the artists in town donated those beautiful doors made of cherry wood. Just gorgeous. Cleomi, a swarm. That was so high, a friend of mine came with those lift buckets and lifted me up, and I got that one. And here was one that I didn't know what to do with at first. <laughs> if you would see my expression, I would say, here's the swarm catching box down there, you know. <laughs> How the hell am I going to get that in there, you know, right there? So it took two of those boxes, and my wife held the boxes while I shook, and she got about 40 stings, and had two days of fever, but felt very good after that. <laughs> Said thank you. Uh, it did not come out of our, our apiary. I saw it with a queen later on, and when the bees don't find a home, and they travel another day and another day, and they are on the third day, they get hungry. And that's when they get aggressive. So we sometimes drop a swarm right onto a piece of board or that, and let them walk in. And just this year, we had two swarms land on two fence posts. And the school class was there. Well, you can't shake the fence post. We, with our bare hands, we lifted them gently off and put them in a box. And in 20 minutes, the hive was in a box. And one sting, because one of the guys squished one, one of the bees. And it's magic how they march into the hive. Or you see a queen. Sometimes when young queens emerge, I've had a queen in my hand. So anyone who can go to London and meet the queen, say, I've had a queen in my hand. <laughs> There's another one just laying an egg. They, those queens can lay 1,500 eggs a day, more than their own body weight. Don't try to duplicate that, ladies. Just amazing transformation of that food. This is a real queen cell. See? The queen, the cells are pointing uh, horizontally. Oh, there you have it. And there the queen is out. The little cap is open. That's fresh honeycomb. They exude it out of their own body. It's part of their body. They don't need plastic there. It's just for everyone an experience to see that fresh honeycomb, transformed sunlight. The cells themselves, they create all of that in darkness. Imagine that. And if you let them do it naturally, they do a little eurythmy. <laughs> they don't like it straight as we do. <laughs> that was out of a worry hive. They, not the direction, they go exactly the opposite, you know. 
So those hives we don't open up. You know, we just say, okay, good for you. The beauty of honeycomb is, I mean, even if you're a beekeeper for 40 years, you're still in awe. And there, you can see when you melt the wax out, some cells go this way, the others the other way. And when you peel that away, you get that beautiful architecture that they create in, in darkness. They are real architects. Look at that. Oh, they love honey, too. Come on. Oh, come on. When the, when the honey is mature, they cover it with a wax so it does not absorb moisture. And when it's in there over the winter, they decorate it. And there you see where the wires are. That's not from my hive. But where the wires are, they don't, they don't put the brood in. And there you can see one bee sweating those platelets of wax. Ah. Right, where am I? Right there. One bee can do eight in one day, and to make one frame of honeycomb takes almost a million. Tremendous work that goes into that. Uh, they come in with big saddlebags, plantain, great borage, stickweed all over our hills. Oh, another plantain, yes. Um, Japanese knotweed. And they don't compete to the other bees. They, you know, there is really a coming together. Yes. <laughs> and on a morning glory. <laughs> now, you just eat a little bit slower and two minutes later, please. Well, I will finish. No. How do you turn that off? Just made it. Yeah. So. Very sorry to have to do this. It's the worst job in the world because that was amazing. I know. But you may be pleased to hear that Gunter is going to be doing some workshops in the next few days. I don't know where. I'm not sure if you know. I don't know where. No. Somewhere in in UK. So Gunter's going to be here tomorrow morning, and then he's going up to Freeman College, and he's going to be in Sheffield until, let me get this right now. Wednesday. Wednesday. And then on Wednesday, he goes down to Ruskin Mill, and he'll be at Ruskin Mill in the afternoon and um, in the evening. And on Thursday, back, back home. Back yeah. home, yes. And give it up for Gunter.